Hi, and welcome back to my channel, where I'm going to cover the Warlock's Celestial Class Specialization from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, providing a brief description of the subclass, as well as explain and set up the various features gained. The Celestial Class Specialization introduces a more clerical concept to the Warlock class, much like the Divine Soul Class Specialization did for the Sorcerer. These Warlocks are more interested in dealing with the darker places of the campaign worlds at the behest of their patrons, and it's not uncommon for Warlocks of this subclass to have sudden bouts of good deeds, if that makes any sense, which the information sheet is kind enough to provide some examples for. This desire is something that is driven into your character by the patron themselves, usually as a test to your devotion to that patron, or at least that is how the DM would explain it if they suddenly had your character take on that kind of mission. Warlocks are also a class that chooses their class specialization at level 1, and this is once again due to the nature of their magic, as it is the patron, if you will, of your character that grants your character the ability to use the powers they are given. So I'm going to go ahead and set up a quick level 1 warlock, and I will bring you back just as I'm about to apply the actual class specialization. So give me a moment, I'll be right back. So I just clicked on the warlock option here for my class selection, and what that has done is down here at the bottom, I now get to see my class specialization. In this particular case, I'm choosing the Celestial. And that's all you do to actually set your specialization. So I'll be right back once I've completed everything else in relation to the setup of this character. So once the character is complete, the first feature your character will gain is called Expanded Spell List feature. And it's specific to the Celestial class specialization. Unlike other classes that are granted spells that don't count against their prepared list of spells, the Warlock only gains the means to choose these spells in place of those they would normally select against in relation to the Warlock table that is provided by the Pact Magic feature. So for example, if you only had Xanathar's Guide to Everything in the Player's Handbook, right away at level 1 and when your character reaches Warlock level 2, your character will be able to select from a total of 3 spells. Those options would be Cure Wounds, Guiding Bolt, and Cause Fear. But at level 1, your character is going to start off with two known spells, and you will gain the means to understand a third when your character reaches level 2. It would essentially have meant that your character would be able to know all of the first level spells as seen in the two tables that we have here. That's provided, however, that you don't have Tasha's Cauldron of Everything loaded, which in this particular case I do, and I'm going to showcase something in relation to that, just simply because it's related to this particular discussion. The Pact Magic feature of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything introduces a much larger selection of spells, which is why this particular character has spells that you normally would not have seen as part of a Warlock selection. The other factor that comes into play is there's also an additional, additional Warlock spells option here, excusing the double term of that use, that grants even more spells that your character can select from. So with Tasha's, the total number of spells the Warlock can choose to understand has grown significantly in relation to what they used to be able to do, which is simply having Xanathar's Guide loaded as well as the Player's Handbook loaded for their modules. But I think you understand the point that I'm trying to make. Your selection of spells when it comes to the Warlock is limited depending on the number of modules that you have loaded. Unlike other classes, the additional spells that you gain through your specialization or the Warlock, are simply ones that you can choose to select. They are not ones that you get right off from the start. They're simply added to the table of the total list of spells you get to choose from. That's it. And that means that these will count against the total number of known spells that your character can learn. Also at Warlock level 1, your character gains two more cantrips through the bonus cantrips feature. And they are the Light and Sacred Flame cantrips. In this case, these two cantrips are in addition to your normal number of known cantrips, which at level 1 is to a total of two cantrips. So your character will in fact be able to start with a total of four known cantrips, and you will be able to use any of them as you normally would make use of a cantrip with no penalty. It should not have to be said, but while your character is casting these two new cantrips, they are in fact counted as warlock cantrips, even if they are not directly from the warlock's list of selected cantrips. So let's go ahead and simply drag these into our character's action sheet here, and they should automatically drop into the cantrips group here, which they have. The final feature your character gains at level 1 is called Healing Light, and this introduces a new way to do healing by providing your character 
with a number of d6 die for your character to use to execute healing on anyone your character can see and who is within 60 feet of where your character currently stands. The total number of these die is 1 plus your character's warlock level, so at level 1 you'll in fact be able to use 2 dice. There is also a maximum to the number of dice that you can roll at one time, and it's equal to your character's charisma modifier, so you'll want to make sure that your character has a good charisma stat to help there. Which really should be anyway, because your character's primary stat is the charisma ability score. Now this part can be a bit confusing, because unless you only have a plus two modifier to your character's charisma stat, it won't really apply to your character until you get to a higher level, so I'll run through an example. Let's say that your character is level 2, thus giving you a total of 3 healing dice you can roll, but they have a plus 4 charisma modifier, much like this character. You'd be able to roll all 3 healing dice in one run, using up to all of your dice during that roll to execute the healing you're trying to do. However, now let's say that your character is level 7, giving you a total of 8 healing dice. Well, now your character can cast 2 sets of 4 healing dice during the different uses of this feature, before they will run out of healing dice. They can't roll any more than that in one run unless, at some point in the future, your character is able to increase the Charisma modifier, say from plus 4 to plus 5, through an Ability Score improvement, or a Magical Item, for example, that might increase your Charisma stat. I'm also going to set this up a little bit differently than I have with other Warlock dice, if you will, in the past, for other older classes. And that's because I found, recently learned of a different way to go through and set this up. So I'm going to go ahead and create a Warlock dice group. Actually, I'm going to call it Warlock Dice Pool. That makes a little bit more sense. I'm going to get rid of that group. Now I'm going to set this group up, much like you've seen me done with a couple of other things. I'm going to make sure that this is using the Charisma stat, because that's this character's base stat. And I'm going to set this up with a total of two, because that's how many dice this character can cast at this particular point in time. It's one plus your level. Now, to simplify things, I'm also going to link in an effect here and it's going to be a healing effect. I am then simply going to drag in 1d6, and the reason why I'm dragging in only 1d6 is to simplify how I'm going to cast this down the road. How this is going to work is as follows. Let's say that we need to heal this ape. At level 1, I currently have the ability to make use of 2 dice. So I'm going to drag, and holding down my left mouse button, click and drag that out, and right click once in order to add two dice to that. I'm then going to drop that right onto the icon for ape one. Now, this ape isn't damaged in any way, shape, or form, so it's not going to do anything. But that gives you an example as to how you would drop this onto a character that you're trying to heal. I would then go ahead and tick both of these off. And that's going to expend the use of this particular feature in such a way that it goes away when you're in an actions group here. You'll see here that that group is gone. It's not there anymore. If I flip that back to standard and uncheck those, you'll see that Healing Light now is there for our Warlock Dice Pool. Now, let's say, for example, and I'm going to temporarily modify this, that our character is level 7. So now we have a total of 8 dice. My Charisma modifier is 4, which means I can use a total of 4 dice. So I'm going to go ahead and drag this once again, right click three times to add three additional dice to bring it to a total of four, and then drop that into place, and we'll heal this a two, for example. Now I have to go ahead and tick this off so that I have a total of four dice used. That's how you can track how many dice you're using. Now, I'm not going to cover it throughout the course of this video, otherwise it would really extend the duration of this particular video, but Every time your character levels up, you're going to want to increase this total number of dice that you have available in the pool. So when your character hits level 2, you will have a total of 3 uses. When your character hits level 4, you will have, sorry, level 3, you will have a total of 4 uses, etc, etc, etc. So I'm going to temporarily just put that back to 2, and then I'm going to expend or unlock all the uses for that particular feature for now. At Warlock level 6, your character will gain the Radiant Soul feature, giving your character resistance to Radiant Damage, and you will now be able to add your Charisma modifier to various spells as a damage bonus, but only once per die roll. 
it will require the damage type to be that of radiant or fire damage for that damage bonus to apply. But this means the following. If you're rolling 46 die of radiant or fire damage, you simply add your charisma modifier to the total of that roll. I was never really fond of how this feature is worded. And I've seen it worded this way with a few other features, but it has really caused some level of confusion in some games that I've been involved in. I've been in situations where players get confused by that wording, and I understand why it's worded that way, but it has triggered a few heated discussions around it because of that. I hope the example that I'm going to present here will help alleviate some of those arguments and allow people to simply focus on the game. So let's go ahead and show you how this actually works. Well, the first thing we will want to do is ensure that we add Radiant Soul to our character's action sheet. I'm then going to create a Celestial group and add in our resistance effect first. I am then going to go ahead and double check a couple of our spells here in a moment. But first, let's go ahead and deal with this. So this is going to be called Radiant Soul. And it's going, semicolon, and it's going to add resist, colon, radiant. It's going to be on self, and it's never going to expire because it's a permanent change. Now, this next feature can be done in two ways. I'm going to take an example of both of them and give you an idea as to what this looks like. So the first things first, I'm going to set up another damage effect here, if you will. I'm also going to call this Radiant Soul, semicolon, but in this particular case, I'm going to go DMG colon and then CHA in square brackets. And what that's going to do is add your charisma modifier as a damage statement here. And I'm going to call this Radiant. I'm going to have to do this again with fire and it's going to expire on the next roll so i'm going to create a second effect and set it up this way okay so i now have both of these set up and i'll show you how to use them here in a moment Instead of doing this, though, there is another way that you could have gone and done this. And I'm going to use this one as an example. You could have simply gone and modified each of the individual spells themselves to add in your charisma modifier as part of your stat here. So if I look here, we still get the plus four radiant damage type here. And then you would modify anything that would deal radiant or fire damage this way. I think that could get a little bit cumbersome because every time you add a spell, you're going to have to double check its damage type and then make this adjustment every single time. I don't want to have to do that. This way gives me the option to simply enable an effect before I roll anything that's doing, for example, radiant damage or anything that's going to be doing fire damage prior to me actually executing that damage roll. Once again, in the combat tracker, I'm going to go ahead and attack this vampire. I've already got them targeted. I'm going to then cast Sacred Flame against that vampire. Now, in this case, they save, which means I do no damage. So I'm going to try to get it so that they actually deal some damage here. And that might actually take a moment, so bear with me a second. There we go. So we now have a fail. That means I can now do radiant damage to that particular vampire. However, before I do that, I want to click this particular effect here. And you will see that we now have a DMG colon for Radiant as part of our effect stat. That means it successfully calculated what our Charisma modifier is. If I were to say bring our Charisma up to, say, a 20 because of an ability score improvement at a later point in time, and then I go ahead and click this effect again, you should see it now increases to a damage of 5 Radiant points of damage. Excellent. That means this is working the way that we need to from that perspective. Now I'm going to go ahead and delete this effect because it's not valid. Now I can go ahead and roll this damage. And what will happen is the effect itself is going to expire and we have our radiant damage added as part of the result roll 
of that particular spell. So we got a 7 as part of the die roll. We now have been able to do a total of 11 points of damage because 7 plus 4 equals 11. And the same thing would apply for anything that is fire damage. Now, the one thing I didn't do was apply our effect resistance. The minute you're dropped into the combat tracker, as long as you have this feature, you can immediately apply this effect. Although that does get replaced later on, so keep that in mind. But as long as your character remains in the combat tracker, this resistance is there and it's a permanent change, meaning it can stay. I just wish that there was a means to tell Fantasy Grounds that, hey, this effect is permanent, so anytime I'm added to a combat tracker, automatically add this effect. I know that there are mods that do that, but it's something I would like to see that would be native to Fantasy Grounds itself. At Warlock level 10, your character will gain the Celestial Resilience feature, which is going to allow you to help your own character and five additional characters by gaining the ability to give them temporary hit points. In relation to your own character, each time your character completes a short or a long rest, they will automatically gain temporary hit points equal to your character's Warlock level plus your character's Charisma modifier. As for the five others, they will gain a total number of temporary hit points equal to half of your character's Warlock level plus your character's Charisma modifier, and this is done immediately after your character completes that rest. When your character wakes up, you can choose those five characters, or creatures, it can, doesn't really much matter, they don't have to be humanoid, and apply those temporary hit points to each of those characters or creatures in turn. But there is a catch with temporary hit points. If a character already has temporary hit points, they may not get the new ones if the amount is more than what you are about to give them. And I'll show you what I mean by that in our example when we go through and finish setting up this feature. So let's drop this onto our character's action sheet. I'm also going to link this into our celestial group. I'm going to minimize that so that we can focus on the feature that we're working on here. I am then going to add two healing abilities here. The first one is going to be for our character. It's going to be on yourself, and it's going to be temporary hit points. And this is going to require a stat level, if you will, as opposed to being related to this. Now, unfortunately, there isn't an easy way to do both your level plus your stat without cheating a little bit. What do I mean by that? First things first, I'm going to select our level. That's going to be Warlock. We want to ensure that the class is selected first. Then we have to add a second heal ability here, if you will. And this one, we want to set it to our Charisma modifier. And you can see that it's going to combine both of these to give us our temporary hit points. We're then going to want to do the same thing for what would be applied to a target. So I'm going to also set this to temp. I'm going to add two effects. Once again, one is going to be for the Warlock level. And one is going to be with our Charisma. But we have to modify this because this is incorrect. It has to be half of your level. So I'm going to type in a 0 0.5 in this multiplier box. That brings it down to 9 because it will round up. And that's perfectly fine. So essentially the way this works is it's going to be half of our level 10, which equals 5, plus plus 4 for our Charisma modifier, which gives us 9. That's perfect. That's what we want. So, and it won't actually be half of 14. I made a mistake there with that math, but that's my apologies. Now we are done with the setup. How does this actually get used? Well, let's say that our character has woken up. In fact, the whole party has just woken up from a short or a long rest. Doesn't really much matter. And let's say that this Hound of Ill Omen is one of our allies at the moment. Same with the Spectre and the Ape, although these are technically summoned quote-unquote creatures from previous classes. <laughs> I'm not going to worry about that for now. What I can do is once my character awakens from that rest or is finished with that rest, I can grant and just simply click that to give myself the temporary hit points, and it will automatically apply. When it comes to applying it to creatures, however, what you're going to want to do is this. You're going to want to untarget any enemies you might have if you left them in there and they are still as part of the combat tracker. 
And then you're going to want to target all of the affected creatures that you want to be able to grant these temporary hit points to. Then simply click on the temporary hit points. Now, you may have noticed that the Hound of Ilhomen already had nine temporary hit points. Here's what happens if the temporary hit points that they have is actually higher. One second, I need to go and temporarily increase that. So with them still targeted, if I go and try to apply temporary hit points again, you'll see it's not going to override that value. If I make this smaller, it will. So you got to be cognizant of that when you're dealing with temporary hit points. And finally, at Warlock level 14, your character will gain the Searing Vengeance feature, helping your character resist death and deal damage at the same time. If at some point your character was reduced to zero hit points and is forced to roll death saves, you can choose to use this particular feature, kind of like a reaction, and heal your character for half of their maximum total number of hit points. This will remove the unconscious effect, although the DM is going to have to do that each time you make use of this feature, and will allow you to return your character to the battlefield. At the time that your character uses this feature, a blinding burst of radiant light emanates from the center of your character, and it has two effects to any creature of your selection that is within 30 feet of where your character was laying down. The first effect is that they will immediately suffer 2d8 plus your character's charisma modifier of radiant damage, which requires no attack roll or saving throw, as it's always going to hit the creature you select. The second is that those creatures are also blinded until the end of the current turn that your character returned to a conscious state. So it won't do much if your character is the last to go in that particular round. It would just end up going away. But it will still deal the damage through that previous version of the effect. Once used, your character will have to complete a long rest in order to regain any and all spent uses. So you only get to use it once. So let's go ahead and add this to our character's actions tab. And I'm simply going to copy and paste this into the group. Now, the good news for us is that the damage is already set up, as is the blinded effect, which is great because it essentially means that we're done. So let me go ahead and show you how this is actually used. Let's say, for example, our character has had all of their temporary hit points burnt through, and they've been reduced to zero, meaning that they are now supposed to be unconscious. Just one second here. I've got to find it. There we go. What this now means is that your character can use this Searing Vengeance feature, which I forgot to set up its uses for. So totally one daily use. There we go. When that happens, your character is going to need to heal themselves. Well, the way that this works is you need to manually add the total number of hit points that your character has and divide them by two. So the maximum number of hit points, which I apparently have flat out removed, I think it was 87, if I'm not mistaken. So you take 87 and divide that by 2, which would be 43 if you're rounding down. In this case, I do believe you get the option to round up. So it's going to be 44 hit points. So what we need to do is simply type in 44 here. Now, if your character levels up again for levels 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, for example, you're going to want to make sure that you recalculate this to take into account your new hit point map. Now, because this character is reduced to zero hit points, so I'm going to do it that way, I get to make use of this feature. That means that I get to heal my character for 44 hit points of damage. I can automatically do that. The unconscious effect does, in fact, go away. Excellent. That means we're good when it comes to that perspective. Now, I get to target any and all creatures that were standing around my character. So let's say this vampire, ape 2, and ape 3, which is already unconscious, and maybe ape 4, were all standing around my character, and they're the reason why my character was reduced to zero hit points. They will now suffer 2d4 points, or sorry, 2d8 points of radiant damage. They will then also be blinded. So every single one of those creatures will now have the blinded effect. Well, technically not Ape 3, but you get the point. There's no saving throw. There's nothing that you they have to do in order to protect themselves against this. They can't. It just simply happens. That's why it's called Searing Vengeance. 
But now, your character's back in the fight. And that really brings us to the end of this particular class, if you will, because level 14 is where you gain your last archetype spell. And a warlock has always been a class that is relatively easy to play, and it is a good class for some just getting into D&D to start off with. But there are a few areas that can be a bit tricky to deal with, and it's usually related to features like the healing dice that this class has. I'm hoping that by setting up your character the way that I have presented it, you will be able to alleviate some of that learning curve, so all you have to really do is simply enjoy the adventure. However, this does bring us to the end of this particular video. I hope you found it useful and informative, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. I wish to thank you for taking the time to watch this particular video. I hope you found it informative and useful to familiarizing yourself with Fantasy Grounds in general, and that you had fun in the process. If you found the video useful and you liked the content of the particular video, go ahead and click that like button to let me know. And if you have any questions specific to the topic covered by this particular video, or just have some comments in general, please feel free to post something in the comments section. I'll do my best to respond to any questions that are asked. Additionally, I do release content quite regularly, and it's generally specific to Fantasy Grounds or 5th Edition Dungeons & Dragons at this time. So if you'd like to be notified when new videos come out, go ahead and subscribe and click the notification bell to ensure that notification is sent to you when I release a new video.